NASA's chief scientist quit last weekend, saying he has found a way to get Mars to terraform itself into a paradise planet. Here are the details. The New York Times reports that NASA's chief scientist started his retirement on Saturday, January 1st, but on the way out, he touted a plan to geoengineer Mars so that humans can live on the planet. Jim Green says his plan is to place a massive magnetic shield between Mars and the Sun to protect Mars from the Sun's high-energy solar particles that have been stripping the planet of water and atmospheric gases for millions of years. With Mars protected from the Sun, the temperature would eventually rise to a point that allows the carbon dioxide on the polar cap to sublimate, returning to the atmosphere and enhancing the greenhouse effect. Green told the newspaper, stop the stripping, and the pressure is going to increase. Mars is going to start terraforming itself. That's what we want, the planet to participate in any way it can. When the pressure goes up, the temperature goes up. Green says higher pressure and temperatures will start the process that will allow humans to grow food in the planet's soil and one day walk freely on Mars without spacesuits. But scientists like Lucien Wachowicz of the Adler Planetarium are not convinced. Wachowicz recently stated, despite terraforming's hold on the popular imagination, it remains solidly in the realm of fiction. For one thing, Mars seems to lack the necessary reserves of carbon dioxide to pump up its atmosphere and warm it in the first place. The science behind Dune, one of the biggest movies this year, is being poured over by fans. But could it be applied in real life? Here's what you need to know. The success of the new Dune movie has people speculating about whether humans changing Mars' surface and atmosphere to be more like Earth's, known as terraforming, is possible, and according to the BBC, the primary issue is creating a breathable atmosphere to match Earth's, where currently plants and bacteria give out oxygen through photosynthesis. For Earth, large-scale oxygenation initially occurred 2.3 billion years ago when bacteria began releasing oxygen as waste, according to the Nature Communications Journal. But the BBC explains the difficulty in artificially introducing bacteria to do the same on Mars is that water which could be used for photosynthesis is currently frozen. One solution to that problem could be building automated factories on Mars that produce greenhouse gases which warm up the planet and melt the ice. However, any additional atmosphere that was generated would still have to deal with an additional problem called spallation, where high-energy radiation from the sun blasts away a planet's atmosphere, a process which already afflicted Mars 3.5 billion years ago. One researcher who spoke to the BBC suggested that once an active biosphere is established on Mars, oxygen production may be able to match losses from spallation. But in 2017, NASA scientists at NASA's Planetary Science Vision 2050 workshop suggested creating an artificial magnetic field that sits in front of the planet in order to protect it from the sun's radiation. The idea is that a structure that generates a magnetic dipole field at the Mars L1 Lagrange point could allow the Martian atmosphere to become thick enough to melt ice at Mars's northern pole and, in time, spark a greenhouse gas effect that could restore some of Mars's oceans. Once a viable, breathable atmosphere is theoretically possible, a much broader range of issues and possible solutions come into play. First, there is the issue of how to get either humans or human stuff up there. Here, in the simplest sense, timing is everything. Once every 26 months, Mars gets close to Earth to create conditions optimal for travel to the Martian surface, that is, using the least amount of energy and the shortest transit time, and this is obviously when it makes most sense to attempt to send anything out there. Next, we need to figure out how to live up there in the period before an atmosphere is established, and here there are competing visions. In 2017, the Chinese space agency Tongji University and Stefano Boeri Architects drew up plans for a colony of forest cities on Mars dubbed New Shanghai. Their concept would see a spaceship ferry a colony of massive pods containing forest cities from Earth toward Mars. Once the pods have touched down on the red planet, in Habitat reports that they would use ecosystemic seeds to take root. However, in the same year, NASA held a competition for companies to design livable 3D printed habitats on Mars, and the company AI Space Factor won with a pod-shaped habitat that can be printed over the course of 30 hours. The pods would be made from materials such as biopolymer basalt composite, which can be extracted from Mars, and the design would also include strategically placed windows that would allow natural light to enter the habitat while keeping out harmful solar and cosmic radiation. Finally, that vision exists in pretty sharp contrast to the first part of the vision Elon Musk has previously laid out, where rather than 3D printing everything, the first Mars pioneers in a hypothetical mission would have to deploy all the hardware themselves, establishing temporary survival 
shelters and setting up a rocket fuel production factory. Here, establishing this rocket fuel factory would be difficult under the harsh conditions, but it would be crucial as it is the only guarantee for the astronauts to return home alive. The factory would use Mars's frozen water and the carbon dioxide molecules that dominate the planet's very thin atmosphere to create methane and liquid oxygen, aka rocket fuel, after establishing the first base. After that point, we can assume that all the different visions would be faced with the same issue though, energy. Any human attempt to build more permanent habitats, greenhouses, and life support systems on Mars would require systems to harness energy and require it fast. Enter NASA's nuclear fission reactor prototype, a nuclear reactor the size of a wastebasket. The first humans on Mars will need to be able to generate power to transform the planet's water and carbon dioxide into liquid oxygen and fuel. Addressing this concern is the Kilo Power Project, a nuclear power system that comes with a uranium reactor core which uses fission to generate electricity. The system can generate 1 kilowatt of electricity which can power a toaster to 10 kilowatts which can light up 100 bulbs. 4 to 5 10 kilowatt units will be needed to power the habitat, generating safe drinking water and oxygen. At this point, things are looking pretty good, with three obvious problem areas left to tackle. How to eat, how to get back, and how not to get fried if you ever go outside your Mars pod in the pre-atmosphere days. The answers to these questions are… we're working on it. NASA's human research program began researching how space radiation affects the human body in 2017, studying how space radiation has enough energy to violently collide with nuclei that make up spacecraft shielding and human tissue, according to Science Daily. Meanwhile, in the same year, the UAE released plans to build a 136 million US dollar city here on Earth called Mars Science City, which consists of interconnected dome structures that will span 1.9 million square feet and will house labs that can simulate various parts of Mars's environment. Researchers will use the labs to practice several methods of farming on light resources as Mars lacks water and nutritious soil and waste and water recycling methods will also be tested. Finally, on the getting back part, earlier this year, NASA reported that it had awarded Northrop Grumman a contract worth up to $84.5 million to help develop the propulsion system that will be used to power the Mars or MAV, a rocket that will launch samples of rock from Mars back to space, which would be one of many stages needed to bring back samples from Mars to Earth for the first time in history. NASA's plan is to let its Perseverance rover, which is currently starting its mission on Mars, collect soil and rock samples, then sealing the samples in protective tubes and dropping them randomly on the Martian surface. In the next few years, the sample retrieval lander will touch down and deploy the sample fetch rover, which will follow in Perseverance's tracks, recover the sample tubes, return them to the lander, and load them into the MAV. The MAV will then blast off from the lander, launching the sample capsule into orbit, where another spacecraft will rendezvous, collect the sample capsule, and return it to Earth. So, it's a start. Following up on his plans to transport 1 million people to Mars by 2050, Elon Musk's company SpaceX has now declared that it will also send hundreds of satellites to Mars to provide the colonists with space internet. SpaceX is currently building a Starlink mega constellation of small communication satellites around Earth and has already launched around 800 of these satellites into low Earth orbit. This mega constellation of satellites will eventually cover every part of Earth, and Elon Musk said it will give all people on Earth access to low cost broadband internet. According to a recent interview with Time magazine, the company now plans to build the same mega constellation around Mars to provide the 1 million future citizens of Mars with space-based internet. Shotwell said the Starlink concept would also create a robust communication link between Mars and Earth, providing an interplanetary internet bridge. This ambitious satellite plan for Mars is typical of Elon Musk, who is spending big money on creating the rockets and spaceships required to get people to Mars. For more news animations and explainers, hit the subscribe and bell button to join the Tomo News family. Thanks for watching.